Shina Rateford from Leeds University will speak about uh, amil seeing amyloid beautiful structure toxic mechanism. Thank you very much. Well, you. It's a very great pleasure to be here. Those of you that know me know I'm a great fan of coming to Israel. So every opportunity I have, I love to come back. So it's a great pleasure to be here and thank you all for listening to me. So I'm going to tell you today a story about amyloid fibres, so these aberrant protein assemblies that have these very beautiful structures, and yet for human health are extremely deleterious. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the story of amyloid and how we're trying to think about new ways of tackling the deposition of protein into amyloid fibres that happens to all of us as we age, and if we have a mutation, unfortunately, happens earlier in life. So just before I start about amyloid, I think we're all structural biologists here in the audience and we all have our protein structures that we love. And we saw in the story from Ada this morning the beautiful structure of the ribosome. Well, I cut my teeth as a protein folder working with Chris Dobson originally in Oxford. And one of the things that I love about proteins is I think about how has that complex molecular machine been made from just 20 amino acids with a few cofactors thrown in. So I'd like you all to think about the structures you're going to see for the next few days and ask for every one of them, how does that fold and assemble? So I think it's an amazing feat of the protein sequences that have, have evolved in evolution that they're able to fold efficiently and assemble in the highly crowded cellular environment. And of course, you'll all know there's molecular chaperones, etc., that help these very complex protein folding assembly reactions to happen when, when molecules are diffusing around in viscosity like glycerol. Now, we all know, I think, about amyloidosis and the threat this is to human health. I think it's worth pointing out to you that there are now about 50 proteins known to form amyloid in human disease. And yet our genomes encode about 30,000 proteins and 100,000 or so different macromolecular complexes. So these diseases of protein misfolding are rare in terms of the number of sequences that could be involved, and yet they're a major threat to human health today. So where are all these 50 uh, amyloid proteins deposited? What kind of diseases do they give rise to? Well, everyone in the room will be familiar, of course, with Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, where alpha-synuclein or A, beta or tau form these plaques that give rise to neuronal cell loss and terrible neurodegenerative disorders. But there are also amyloid deposits that occur systemically in virtually every region of the body. Each of these is formed from a precursor protein that folds normally to carry out its normal function. But as we age or if we have a mutation, something happens and the proteins start behaving badly. And those badly behaving proteins will site specifically deposit in different organs and cause disease. And I'm going to tell you about two of these today because they're very different. Beta-2 microglobulin and dialysis amyloidosis and alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's disease. So as a structural biologist, what's fascinating is that all of these amyloid fibres have a common cross-beta architecture, and you, I think you're going to see lots of structures of amyloid in Maitl's talk coming after mine, so I'll skip over um, some of that today. So the question is, how can so many different proteins form this cross-beta structure, given they have different native structures? Why do they cause different diseases? And why do they deposit specifically in different organs when many of the proteins are carried systemically throughout the body? So the challenge in understanding and treating amyloid is that we don't know why certain organs are involved. We can't predict how disease will develop or when. We don't understand the mechanisms of disease, what causes cytotoxicity and cell death. And there's only one amyloid, transarotin amyloidosis, for which there's a small molecule therapeutic currently on the market. For the rest, we have no therapies. And the challenge, I think, is we don't know who to treat, when to treat, or how to treat them. Now, you'll all be aware of the terrible time we're having 
as a scientific community in thinking about developing strategies for amyloidosis, and there's been some very uh, highlight failures in antibody therapies, for example, for Alzheimer's disease. So this one in Biogen, uh, where the phase three uh, cl clinical trial failed with a, an 18 billion loss in their market share, although they have relaunched it recently. So the major challenge here in understanding the mechanism of amyloidosis and how to deal with it. So as structural biologists, this is how we think about the course of amyloid formation, where the native protein is in dynamic equilibrium with one or more partially folded or unfolded states. These then start self-assembling via a slew of different oligomeric states. Some of these may be cytotoxic, some of them may not. Some of them may be productive for amyloid formation, some of them may be dead-end traps. We can then form amyloid fibres, which as individual filaments can contribute to disease because they fragment and allow new fibrils to grow, or they can catalyse uh, fibril formation by a surface-mediated nucleation. And then eventually these fibres self-assemble into these plaques that you're familiar with. So what we're trying to do is to understand this entire reaction scheme, the structures of all the species, the rate constants of interconversion, the equilibrium populations, to understand two things, the structural mechanism of amyloid formation and how cells respond to it. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm going to talk about these very early initiating stages of, of amyloid formation and ask the question, can we map and target these early protein-protein interactions that give rise to the formation of amyloid? And think about this as a strategy to delay the onset of protein aggregation in vivo. And specifically the question I want us to think about is, well, how specific are these early initiating interactions? Because, of course, these are aberrant interactions. Evolution has no functional reason to do this. It's a, it's a disaster, it's a mistake of proteins behaving badly. And so the question is, is how specific are these interactions? Are they just non-specific, hydrophobically collapsed, non-native proteins sticking together? Or is, are there specific interaction interfaces that we could find and target to prevent aggregation? So I'm going to tell you two stories today. One is beta 2 microglobulin, as I've mentioned, uh, forms dialysis amyloidosis. Beta 2 microglobulin is uh, found in your blood, but it deposits into amyloid specifically in collagenous rich joints, as shown here in this patient. And the key for beta 2 microglobulin is the protein starts for an anti-parallel immunoglobulin domain fold and forms a parallel in register amyloid structure. So how does that conformational conversion happen? The second I've chosen to talk about is alpha synuclein involved in Parkinson's disease, where you get a degradation of the substantia nigra. And I chose this to talk to you about because the protein's initially an intrinsically disordered protein, so it gains structure as it goes through the amyloid cascade. So let's talk about beta 2 microglobulin first. So beta 2 microglobulin here in yellow forms a non covalently bound light chain of your MSC class 1 antigen, which is required for presentation of peptides in your immune response. Now, the normal catabolic cycle of beta 2 microglobulin is it dissociates from the heavy chain and then is degraded in your kidneys. If you have renal dysfunction, you can't do this. The concentration of BC2M uh, increases uh, in the serum, and it forms a classic, beautiful cross-beta structure of amyloid that we solve the structure of using cryem. And you can see in this image here that when you form these uh, amyloid fibers in the joints, this is the top of the femur, you end up with these dreadful musculoskeletal uh, problems of, of degradation of the skeleton. So what you need to understand for this little story is while b microglobin is essential for immunity and it folds correctly, it undergoes a conformational conversion to form amyloid fibres. <laughs> now if we take these fibres out of patients, 30% of the protein miss, is missing the N-terminal 6 residues that takes you to the beginning of the A strand here. And so you, we call this protein delta N6 and you're going to hear a lot about it. <laughs> 
So this is where the story started. So we're trying to grow amyloid fibers in the test tube in vitro, and we're measuring amyloid formation with a binding of the dye thioflavin T. And you can see that whilst a wild type protein forms amyloid in patients, it's really resilient to forming amyloid in vitro. No FAT, no uh, fibrils in EM. However, this variant that's this miss missing the N terminal 6 residues forms amyloid fibrils rapidly by a classic nucleation dependent growth mechanism, and we see fibres in REM. Well, this is an amyloidogenic protein and a feat of a whole PhD thesis by Timo Eichner. He was able to solve the initial monomeric structure of delta N6 using NMR spectroscopy. It's too dynamic for crystallography, it's too small for EM. And what he was able to show, much to our surprise at the time, was that this amyloid precursor has the same antiparallel immunoglobulin fold as the wild type protein, but removal of the N-terminal 6 residues allows this cisproline required for binding to the MHC heavy antigen by making a hydrophobic patch up here, this cisproline flips to trans. And so the first take-home message I want you to take away from this is that switching on amyloidosis is really subtle and requires for this protein isomerization of a single peptide bond. So what I want to talk to you about now, so we've, we've looked at the amyloid process, uh, the folding and unfolding process using many techniques. This intermediate is not amyloidogenic, this one delta N6 is, and related to the wild type protein by cis to transproline. What I want to talk about today is these intermediates that form during amyloid formation. So as I mentioned, are they specific or non-specific stickiness? When does the conformational conversion to cross beta occur? And can you think about targeting these early protein-protein interactions? So to do this, we clearly need a combined kinetic and structural approach. And I'm not going to go into much detail at all today, but you'll all understand that to map which species are present versus time, we need to be able to detect them, and we need numerical kinetic models to identify the population and rate constants of the reaction. So whilst kinetics is great at telling us which species are present, it's lousy at telling us anything structural. And so we need it to combine this with structural approaches that can measure structure on the fly. We can't purify any of these species, they're too dynamic. So the best method to de determine structures of rarely populated interconverting species on the fly is NMR. So you're going to see some NMR. So this was the key um, experiment. This was done by Theo Karamanos when he was a postdoc in the group. So here we're measuring the rate of amyloid formation of delta N6 as a function of protein concentration. And here, if you look at the initial rate versus the concentration, you can clearly see non-linearity. And this tells us that there must be one or more high molecular weight oligomeric species required for fibril formation, and they don't reach a high enough con uh, concentration until some critical uh, concentration is reached. So we know that unusually the uh, elongating species is not the monomer. So what are these oligomers? So Theo went off and put the sample in the analytical ultracentrifuge, and this was one of the most, one of those days you've all had them when you think this wasn't supposed to be as simple as this. I thought we'd see the Himalayas of oligomeric species. We didn't. We see all Theo saw monomer, dimer, and hexamer, and not much at all in between. So we know that we have a 1, 2, 6 equilibrium. So we can now do some NMR, and we can map the NMR spectrum and look at the chemical shifts as a function of protein concentration and see them moving around in quite a complex manner, which I won't go into. But we can map these chemical shifts as a function of concentration, and we can extract the binding constants. And this tells us these dimers are weak, but the hexamers formed by the trim trimerization of dimers is really tight. Weak dimers tight tech hexamers. <laughs> so now we know which species are present in our ensemble, remember there's no purification, we can apply a slew of NMR methods, each of which has different ability to pull out different structural parameters 
from an interconverting mass of oligomeric species. And so there are NMR methods. We can look at equilibrium distributions of monomeric species, but we can also map early transient protein-protein interaction, dynamic heterogeneous ensembles. And we also have methods where we can look actually how these oligomers bind on and off fibrils. And so I'm not going to show you any of the NMR data. Suffice it to say it was four years' work using every NMR technique that we could get our hands on. And the upshot um, of this work was this beautiful, well, I think it's beautiful, you can make your own minds up. I've written an atom precise view of the initiating stages of B2M uh, aggregation. So you've seen delta N6 here. What we determined, and I'll show you these structures in a bit more detail in a moment, we form these weak head to head elongated dimers. These dimers then trimerize to form these very beautiful hex elongated hexameric structures. The binding free energy of those hexamers is sufficient to unfurl the immunoglobulin domain, which starts to unfold from its C terminus. And then something happens, which I don't know what it is, and the protein changes from an antiparallel to a parallel in register structure. So clearly for the future, we have uh, some more work to do. We also were able to show that the murine, the mouse protein shown here in orange, is 70% identical in sequence, 90% similar to the human protein, and yet it's not amyloidogenic. And when we mix a mouse protein with a human protein, we inhibit aggregation. So we have two homologous dimers, productive and inhibitory for amyloid formation. So when you look at these two dimers, I think the results are quite striking. So here's this elongated on-pathway dimer with a micromolar KD. Here's the inhibitory dimer, it's also weak. And hopefully you can see here that they're both head-to-head, -head, but the angle between the monomers is much more acute here. And only two of the three immunoglobulin domain loops are involved in this interface, where the interface involves probably all three. And that cysteine, that proline I've been telling you around about is right here in the epicenter of these interfaces. So what does this tell us in general? Well, the first thing, of course, it tells us that amyloid formation, at least for this protein, is really specific. And we've been able to map key interfaces that this weak binding is sufficient to inhibit aggregation. So when we're thinking about op therapeutic opportunities, we don't need nanomolar affinities to disrupt a micromolar binding constant. It also really highlights the specificity of amyloid formation for this protein, because clearly the nature of these early protein-protein interactions determines the outcome of assembly. There's a lot of modelling gone on here, kinetic modelling, NMR modelling, and we need to know that this um, is A, correct, that this interface is required uh, for amyloid formation with, to get some um, orthogonal information, but also to test whether if we target this uh, interaction interface with a small molecule, can we switch off amyloid formation. And so this is the next student, Emma Kaywood, and my collaborator, Andrew Wilson, in chemistry at the University of Leeds in the Asprey Centre. And we set Emma the challenge of finding a small molecule that would bind to a partially folded state that has no natural ligands, um, is partially folded and dynamic, and is going to inhibit amyloid formation. And you really need bright students that are rather naive to get them to even take on these, these projects. So Emma mapped the surface of, we had 20 models for the delta and 6 structure, because it's very dynamic. She mapped their structure using a small molecule mapping. She found uh, two little uh, pockets in, that were consistent in several of the on, members of the ensemble, close to this dimerization interface, one on the front of the molecule, one on the back. Look at serine 52 here. It's in both structures. And you're down here on the molecule just to orient you. And so what we decided to do was use disulfide tethering to try and increase the affinity of small molecule ligands and to target them to the site we want 
rather than to other sites on the molecule. And so what Emma did was create a beta 2 m variant that had a cysteine either at 33 or at 52 or at 65. And she exploited this very powerful disulfide tethering a method to pull out small molecule ligands. And so she makes a library of disulfide containing uh, small molecule ligands, mixes them with our protein, lets the di um, disulfide formation come to equilibrium, and then by my spectrometry looked at the thermodynamic distribution of blue ligands that are covalently uh, linked to the protein, or green. And if they bind tighter, they'd be more populated in the equilibrium distribution that we measure by mass spectrometry. And so Emma made a library of 84 disulfide-containing compounds and screened them by mass spec five at a time. And I'm just going to show you the, the results for uh, one of these ligands. So we use beta mercaptoethanol as our uh, decoy um, uh, molecule we added to these two sites. And here's one of her ligands, uh, S54. And here I'm showing you putting beta mercaptoethanol or S54 either to site 52 <coughs> or to site 65. So if you look here on site 65, beta mercaptoethanol makes aggregation worse. Um, S54 does nothing. Delta and 6 is in black. However, when you put this same ligand on uh, this different site, uh, site 52, you can now see that at site 52, we can have a dramatic effect on slowing down the rate of aggregation. And so I think this shows us that even a small molecule can prevent protein-protein interactions that drive amyloid formation. And I think it reinforces the view, at least for this protein, that amyloid formation is very specific, with a specific protein-protein interaction interface required for aggregation. And that specificity is not only in the identifier of the interface, but also in the identity of the ligand and the location of the site. And so I think this gives us opportunity, especially for patients already on um, dialysis for renal replacement, to think about molecules that could perhaps delay the onset of aggregation. So I think to conclude this first part on beta-2 microglobulin and this pathway I've shared with you, I think the conclusions are that there's a remarkable specificity of these protein-protein interactions that initiate amyloid formation. I think we now, we the world, have the methods needed to map these early protein-protein interactions. And I think if we can target these uh, early protein-protein interactions with small molecules, it'll give us opportunities to ask questions like which is the toxic species and what is the mechanism of toxicity by trapping species, but also to think about therapeutic opportunities into the long term. So I've been telling you all along about a protein that's initially folded and changes structure to form amyloid. And the strategies we're using to think about preventing those protein-protein interactions. And all the oligomers that you saw were highly structured. And so, of course, the next question is, well, is what we're learning just specific to that one protein? And how, how far are these take-home message, messages relevant for the class of proteins that aggregate through initially unfolded states, intrinsically disordered states, like alpha-synuclein? So I'm going to tell you a story now done by Sabina Ulamek and a postdoc Kieran Doherty and other NMR postdoc Roberto Maya Martinez, where they've taken this strategy forward for alpha synuclein. So a little bit about alpha synuclein to introduce you to it. So I've told you already it's the protein that aggregates in Lewy bodies in Parkinson's disease. It's intrinsically disordered. And it has a very odd sequence. The N-terminal half is 140 residues. The N-terminal half is ampipathic. It has these KXK EGV repeats. And this is the region that has familial mutations that lead to early onset disease. Now, this N-terminal region is known to be, uh, have high affinity for binding to biological membranes, especially those in the synapse. And to be critically involved through this functional activity in um, a synaptic vesicle fusion um, at the pre and post trans, uh, uh, at the synapse. 
Now, the next bit of the protein is called the NAC region, the non-amyloid component, which is a ridiculous name, because this is the region that is known to be necessary and sufficient for amyloid formation. It's called non-amyloid because it's not a beta. So there's been various structures of synuclein um, amyloid solved in the last years through cryem. I think 10 or 12 different structures, include, including a beautiful structure um, by the Cambridge lab, Shaw Sherez and Michelle Godot at the LMB, of the first um, synuclein from, uh, amyloid from Lewy bodies. But these are from um, David Eisenberg's uh, group a couple of years ago now, which in this field is ancient history. But I like this one, so I chose it to show you because I want you to focus here on this NAC region. I'm sorry the colours have changed, but I've stolen it from their paper. The NAC region here is in red. And this pre-NAC region, uh, residues 35 to 60, I want you to focus on for the rest of this talk, is in blue. And what you can see here is that amyloid is highly polymorphic. Despite the fact all of these proteins have a cross beta structure and these beta strands are running out into the lecture theatre and back into the board, you can see that synuclein can form many different structures around the cross beta fold. And in some of these structures, the NAC region is at the central core of the amyloid fibre, but in others it's on the more periphery. And in all of these structures, this, reg this blue region, 35 to 60 is involved in the amyloid core, sometimes at the centre, sometimes at the periphery. And note that there's 140 residue protein, only about 40 to 50 residues you're looking at here in the structured core. Okay, so how can we look at these protein-protein interactions in IDPs? Well, it's quite tough by NMR because we don't have a lot of chemical shift dispersion. So we turned our um, focus on using dynamic force spectroscopy. And this is a cool technique and it's really powerful. So we have an AFM cantilever, which we dangle one monomer off. We have a pegylated surface that we attach another monomer to. We bring them together to let the molecules interact if they want to, and then remove, uh, extend the cantilever away. And if they interact, there'll be a force of disruption of that interaction which will occur at a defined distance that tells us where the interacting surface is. And I think this is one of the only methods I can think of that allows us to look at only dimers from this slew of oligomeric states. So Kieran Doty did this for his PhD, and this is just to show you what the data would look like. So if there is, this is a, from a different project with measuring protein-protein interactions. So if there is an interaction, we can measure a rupture force on these force distance plots as you bring the cantilever in and then retract it. And if we plot the data in a two-dimensional for, uh, format with the force against the distance, if there's a specific interaction, we'll get a hot spot. If there's no interaction, we'll get nothing. If there's a weak interaction, we get nothing. And if there's non-specific interaction, we'll get spots all over the place. And much to my astonishment, and I'm still astonished by data that comes out of the lab, we saw these very beautiful uh, rupture forces, just as beautiful as when we look at tight protein-protein interactions. And here we were immobilizing synuclein from its C-terminus. If we plot these two-dimensional plots, you can see a very nice hot spot, a rupture force is about 50 piconewtons at a distance at about 50 nanometers. And so this hotspot tells us that there's a force-resistant interaction, which means, and a hotspot, which again tells us it must be localized at a defined length. So how can we find the length? Where is this protein-protein interaction that's so strong? In two IDPs. And so um, the next thing we can do is we can, as I mentioned, we can measure the distance to rupture, and that will tell us whether the interaction interface in red here is in the middle of the chain, we'd have a short uh, contour length. If it's at the termini of the chain, we'll have a longer contour length. And we immobilize via cysteines, and so we can move the cysteines around to attach the molecule by the C terminus or near the N terminus and remeasure these distances, and then hone in on where the interaction interface is. 
And what we discovered from these experiments, which actually aren't published yet, is that it's this region that's involved in that protein-protein interaction, ratios 40 to 60, not the amyloid core that's necessary and sufficient for amyloid formation. So the initial drivers of aggregation occur out with the amyloid forming region. So the first dimer involves interactions in residues 40 to 60. It's uh, specific and it's force resistant. And this resistance, this is a very high number, consistent with breaking a protein-protein interaction of a, of a structured protein. And it's consistent actually beta strand formation. Mm. So with that in mind, we started staring at the sequence of alpha <coughs> synuclein shown here. And we stared at the sequence with three sets of glasses, one using Michele Vendruscolo's prediction algorithm Zagregator, which predicts amyloid propensity for all the protein residues in the sequence, uh, Vendruscolo's CAMSOL, which tells us about local solubility on a per residue basis, and David Eisenberg's steric zipper, which uh, predicts whether a, a, a protein wants to form a tight protein-protein interfacing cross beta. And what we discovered, if you stare at these with the right eyes, so let you, to give you the right glasses, here's this NAC region necessary and sufficient for amyloid formation. And as you would expect, it has a high amyloid score, shown here in pink and yellow. It's not soluble, shown here. And it's picked up as forming a cross beta structure by David Eisenberg's steric zipper. If you look here in this region we picked up by the dynamic force spectroscopy, it then becomes obvious two regions with high amyloid propensity, low solubility. One is picked up by David Eisenberg's algorithm, but not the other. And I'm going to call these P1 and P2. P1 is just seven residues long in this 140 residue protein, and P2 is 12 residues long. So the next question is, well, what are these regions doing? How, how relevant are these protein-protein interactions for amyloid formation in this IDP? So Kieran and Sabina deleted one or the other or both and several controls and measured the effect on aggregation, on the conformational distribution of the monomer and on the biological function because this, remember, is the region involved in membrane binding at the synapse. So just to share some data with you, here is alpha-synuclein wild type aggregating nicely in the test tube and we worked at cytosolic pH and lysosomal pH, both relevant to amyloid formation of this protein. And you can see we form amyloid fibres. When we delete P2 on its own, very boringly, not much happens, and we still form fibres. This is the striking result, is when we remove this seven residue sequence from this 140 residue IDP, leaving the NAC region necessary and sufficient for amyloid formation alone, the protein no longer aggregates <coughs> at neutral pH, and aggregation is retarded fivefold at a lysosomal pH. And when we delete both P1 and P2, alpha-synuclein becomes a non-amyloidogenic protein, despite the fact its aggregation prone region, the NAT region, is left intact. Well, is this just um, a biophysical artifact? So in collaboration with Patricia Van Oosten Hall in the Aspie Centre in Leeds, we popped these through proteins linked to YFP in the body-worn muscle of C. elegans, and here you can see in those worms, wild types of nuclein starts to form green puncture at day zero of adulthood. And these increase with time and the worms start to get sick. They have a stress responses. They don't wiggle anymore. That's my worm term, wiggling. Um, so the body wall muscles have dysfunction. Um, so they have many uh, phenotypic problems. But in our worms that lack just seven residues of P1 or delta delta, both of them, we see no aggregation almost throughout the entire lifespan of the worm. So this P1 region is required, it drives aggregation in vitro and in vivo. So what does this residue, so why is this region that's functionally important driving aggregation? So we had a quick look 
at the properties of the, of the molecule, the IDP, using NMR. And I'm not going to go through this in any detail, just to say we put a, a free radical, a spin layer, free electron here, and it changes the line width of residues it's close to. So in an IDP, in an ideal world, if it's completely disordered, every residue should be seeing every other residue, with a probability that depends on how far away you are in the sequence. Clearly what you can see from these data is it doesn't look like that. So these P1 and P2 regions are close to the spin label when we put it at residue 18, and they're talking to the NAC region, and they're even talking to the C-terminus of the protein. So this IDP is not very intrinsically disordered at all. It's forming uh, transient but very specific interactions. If we decrease the magnitude of these interactions by changing the solution conditions, we slow aggregation, demonstrating their importance. And so the take home from this is that these regions, P1 and, and facilitated by synergistically with P2, we're calling master controllers of assembly because their interaction with the aggregation prone region is controlling aggregation. So finally, these regions that are conserved are functionally important in membrane fusion. So what happens if I delete these residues? So here's just, this is my last data slide. So here I'm showing you some EMs of the wild type protein uh, that's been mixed with um, vesicles formed from DMPS, which is a mimic of the synaptosome membrane. And you can see what wild type synuclein does. It forms, it allows the vesicles to fuse and you form these rather beautiful uh, tubules. You can see some vesicles in the background. When we look at our um, deletion variants, we can see that this ability, this functional ability, is ablated. And so these regions that are driving aggregation are also important in the biological function of the protein. So what have we learned from this? So I think the take home from this is that even for this intrinsically disordered protein, synuclein, the first interaction seems to be highly specific, albeit transient. And there's some very specific intramolecular interactions, even though the protein's intrinsically disordered. That these, protein, these interactions are the first uh, drivers of aggregation, not just intramolecular, I didn't show the data, but they form the first intermolecular interactions. This early dimer is force resistant, consistent with beta strand formation. But these residues are, are required and contained in the sequence because they're functionally important in your synapsome signaling, which you need throughout your life, whereas aggregation is a consequence of uh, aging. So there's a delicate balance of function versus aggregation. And so finally, two papers have come out very recently, which I think we've gone back and had a look at. Now we understand what P1 and P2 are doing. This is a very beautiful paper from Sebastian Hiller's lab, who showed that exactly this same region, P1 and P2, are required for binding a slew of molecular chaperones, explaining how molecular chaperones prevent aggregation by preventing the master driver of aggregation from making its contacts. And then in this uh, beautiful work from um, Wolfgang Hoyer and Alex Buell in Eli just last year, they have these protein molecules they call beta rapins. And they had one that prevented the aggregation of alpha synuclein. And we're able to show that it binds to residues 34 to 57, driving hairpin formation. And this is P1 and P2. So my final take home from both halves of this talk, I think, is what we've learned from our studies is that for both structured and unstructured proteins, the initial stages of aggregation are much more specific than we thought. I think providing real opportunities to intervene in slowing aggregation, and I've shown you examples with protein-protein interaction with the beta rapin or small molecules. And so I think there's great hopes that we could perhaps in the future think about understanding amyloid formation in more, in more detail using these chemical biology approaches and also by targeting these weak interactions to ameliorate aggregation in living organisms. So I just want to thank uh, my amyloid team. I think I thank people as I've gone through. This is the current team. I have not talked about most of their work, so I can talk about that next time. 
lots of excellent collaborators from around the world and we couldn't do anything without money. So thank you to the money givers and thank you for listening. Questions? Yeah. <clears throat> although Alpha Snickland is, is an IDP, is it possible that, in fact, it's an, it consists of an ensemble of many different states, but certain states are more popular, and this P1 and P2, in fact, have a certain infrequent, but a per certain propensity for a certain structure which is doing all this? That's exactly what I was trying to say. So thank you for making it much clearer than I did. So absolutely. So these IDPs are forming these specific but transient interactions. And by tipping the equilibrium one way or, or the other, you can then uh, promote aggregation over not. And I think this is a powerful opportunity for thinking about therapeutic opportunities for all of you young people in the audience, because it's not like curing a bacterial infection where you need to clear every bug, otherwise it's going to come back. Here you're dealing, amyloid is a kinetic disease. Amyloid is a thermodynamically stable minimum. What we're trying to do is delay the rate of aggregation. So small differences in population have big differences in the rates. Maybe yes. that will allow to keep the biological function, but to remove the obligation problem. So, in the paper that I talked about, that's just coming out in Nature Structure Biology in a couple of weeks' time. The, the um, what do we do in that paper? So, in that paper, we replace the we replace the P1 and P2 regions with GS linkers, and so glycine, gly, glycine, serine, glycine, serine, glycine, serine. So we kept the length of the protein the same and just removed the specific residues. And there, the protein doesn't aggregate. Sorry, the protein, yeah, the protein doesn't aggregate, nor does it function. And that tells you that you need specific residues in those regions that control both function and aggregation. And we're in the process of doing a deep mutational scan of those regions to try and unpick uh, the, the, um, the, the residue residue interactions that are involved. What I can tell you, if you make single point mutations, you get striking results across P1. But we're not quite sure about the identity of the residues. A wonderful talk, Tashina. Okay. Um, I have a question. Uh, taking you back to, to, to the first slides, you say that one of the questions is why specific organ or tissue has this pathology and another doesn't. The question if this P1, P2 domains, or maybe NAC domain, they have additional interactions or modification in specific tissue, in specific place that mediates. So I think that's a, a really good point. So clearly, what's different? Well, for these two microglobulin, what's very clear is that the protein has affinity for collagen. And we actually used NMR to show that when the wild type protein binds to collagen, it unfolds and flips its proline. So that's a really nice example where a local environment is changing the conformational dynamics. Um, but you're also right, for, for B2M we had a truncation. For synuclein there are C-terminal, N-terminal truncations. There's a gazillion post-translational modifications. There's a familial mutations in the regions I told you about, which I should have emphasized more. But also there's the, the epigenetics, there's a chaperone pool within the cell. And I think what we really want to do with some of these chemical pro small molecule probes or protein probes that can control aggregation, we can start, we hope the field can start to ask, the, to answer that question you asked is which chemical modification, which chaperones really matter and how do you tip the balance back? So the answer is I have no idea and it's what we should all go home and work on. <laughs> Thank you very much.